a possible cause for right ventricular dilatation and problems, hemodynamic problems of the right ventricle is a very important pathology. It's pulmonary embolism. In pulmonary embolism or in lung infarction, you will see that the right ventricle is dilating because there is a pressure overload. So in this case, we do see that the right ventricle is severely dilated. Just compare the right ventricle with the left ventricle. So it's definitely not compressed. So it's a different situation compared to what we have seen before. We do see a degree of epicardial fat, but definitely not a relevant pericardial effusion. And we do see that the left ventricle truly is very small in size due to the severely dilated right ventricle. Furthermore, we do see warm motion abnormalities of the right ventricle. We do see that especially the mid portions, they are A or even discarnatic. The apical portions and the basal portions are contracting a bit better, especially the apical portions. They are dragged towards the left ventricle, so that's the contraction of the left ventricle. So keep that in mind while evaluating for pulmonary embolism. This is also the so-called McConnell sign. In this case over here, we do see a design of the left ventricle, which you already can appreciate in this view because the septum is pushed from the right side of the heart towards the left side of the heart. The pressure flattens the septum. So here we have a pressure overload, again, because of a central hemodynamically relevant pulmonary embolism and the heart, which has a so-called D-shaped form. The left ventricle looks simply like the letter D. Continuing with pulmonary embolism, we have to leave the right heart and move towards the pulmonic valve and the pulmonic trunk. Sometimes in central pulmonary embolism, you will even be able to visualize a thrombus directly. So here we have the pulmonic valve, here parts of the ascending aorta, the pulmonic trunk, and here we have the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries we have right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. In this case, we do see the thrombus, especially over here. You have to pay close attention. It's not always that easy to see. In a situation when it's harder to see, also overgaining might help. Be aware that could also be a pitfall that you're overinterpreting a higher gain with a possible thrombus. In this case, it was proven by chest CT that there is truly here this central pulmonary embolism. So here we have the parts of the aorta, here the pulmonic trunk, the right and the left pulmonary artery. And in this case, we have the thrombus. Here are some more examples where you can see a central pulmonary embolism. Here is a subcoastal short axis view. We have again the right pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery. And here you see the thrombus, the overriding thrombus, the pulmonic trunk, the pulmonic valve, here the RVOT, that's the tricuspid valve, the aortic valve in the center, and here the interatrial septum, which is hypermobile. With more depth, it's even more obvious that here in this subcoastal image, there is this central pulmonary embolus. Another sign we might utilize in case of a central or a hemodynamically relevant pulmonary embolism is the so-called 60-60 sign. We have a measurement with the pulse wave Doppler. We place the pulse wave Doppler below the pulmonic valve and measure the pulmonic acceleration time. So a time where the blood is pushed out of the right ventricle and in a central or hemodynamically relevant pulmonary embolism, this time interval will be very short because of the high pressure which follows in the pulmonary arteries. In this case, it's 55 milliseconds. So that's the first part of the 60-60 design. So the pulmonary acceleration time is below 60 milliseconds. Below 60 milliseconds is a shows a very high likelihood that a pulmonary hypertension is present. In this case, it's an acute form because of pulmonary embolism. The second measurement we have to perform is the continuous wave Doppler measurement across the tricuspid valve, where we do see tricuspid regurgitation, but we also have a degree of pulmonary hypertension. So here we see that the pressure gradient is above 30-35 millimeters of mercury. For the 60-60 sign, we have a 
TR pressure gradient, which is below 60 millimeters of mercury. Be aware that in pulmonary embolism, very often it doesn't reach 60 millimeters of mercury. Very often it's in the range of 40, 45 millimeters of mercury. So definitely below 60 millimeters of mercury. So we have one sign which is highly suggestive that there is a relevant pulmonary hypertension. But when we measure it in case of also not a severe or massive or torrential tricuspid regurgitation, the gradient which we measure will be plausible and below 60 millimeters of mercury, whereas in pulmonary hypertension, in, for example, diffuse burn hematous lung diseases, the gradients will exceed 60 millimeters of mercury if you truly find the pulmonary acceleration time below 60 milliseconds.